go to gardening. And quite a few of you are, you know, have been gardening for a while. And then um, it's kind of across the board, those that are growing food and it's almost 50, 50, those that have fruit trees. So thank you so much for indulging me with the poll. Let's get this off the screen. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All Thank right, you. I'll introduce you real quick, Suzanne. So welcome Beautiful. everybody. We're so glad to have you here this evening. And Suzanne Bontempo is the program manager for Our Water, Our World, or we call it Oh Wow. Um, she has been a professional gardener for over 20 years. She's an IPM specialist, which stands for Integrated Pest Management. Um, she is qualified water efficient landscaper. She is a Rescape California professional. She's got all kinds of certifications, but she's also just delightful. So um, I hope you all enjoy this. It's sponsored by the city of Santa Rosa as part of our stormwater program. We're really just trying to help people learn different ways to um, have a beautiful landscape and take care of things without causing pollutants that can enter our creeks and, and cause problems for wildlife. Um, and so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or you can put them in the Q&A. Um, the Q&A would really be great for any question that you'd like to have answered at the end. If it's a resource you wanna share or you didn't understand something that was said and is critical for you to understand to keep going, stick that in the chat. I'll be monitoring both of those. I'm from the city of Santa Rosa, my name's Kellen. Um, I will jump in with you know, questions as needed, but for the most part, we're gonna hold all our questions to the end. Um, everybody's on mute and their video is off. You can also raise your hand if you'd like to participate at the end. Um, so yeah, take it away, Suzanne. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, everyone. We are going to talk about eco-friendly uh, pest and disease management for seasonal pest problems. Let's see. All right. So I'm going to be going through slides for about an hour, um, most likely, hopefully a little shorter than that. I'll definitely leave time at the end for your questions. And we're going to touch on what the OWL program is. We're going to talk briefly about watersheds and water quality, uh, introduction to integrated pest management, best practices for weeds, uh, managing plant diseases, managing ants in the home, um, IPM or integrated pest management for rodents. Uh, when using pesticides, some tips I can share. Uh, I'll share some online resources that are similar to uh, the handouts that I've given you. And then of course the time for Q&A. So City of Santa Rosa uh, Water is sponsoring this program and you can see all of the past uh, workshops, any webinars that have been recorded here on their website, as well as um, upcoming workshops. So you see here, uh, it is a little dated. This is from September, I didn't um, refresh the screen, but this is where you're gonna see upcoming workshops and past workshops. So please go to srcity.org forward slash workshops for that. And the Our Water, Our World program, many of us aren't familiar with it, uh, but for those of you that are curious, it is a program that brings awareness between pesticides and water quality. And we partner with retailers uh, that sell pesticides and the local uh, water pollution prevention agencies such as City of Santa Rosa Water. And we provide education for the public on how to solve pest problems with a less toxic approach with the intention of reducing pollutants that get into our waterways. And uh, we all live in a watershed. Here we are in the beautiful Russian River watershed, but wherever you are in California, we are in a watershed. And when we get a rain event, uh, like we're about to get, which is very exciting, uh, when the water falls on the ground, some of that water, that rainwater will infiltrate into the soil, but a lot of times, especially if the rain event is uh, a little bit heavier, the water is going to run off. And when it runs off, it finds its way to a local creek, a river, some type of a waterway that will then end up in uh, eventually, in this case, the Pacific Ocean. In some cases, it will uh, go to a bay first. It'll end up in estuaries and marshes, things like that. And along the way, it's picking up any type of 
um, debris, litter, pet waste, chemical pollutants, and so forth. And so um, similar to our home uh, uh, watershed is essentially, uh, you can think of it as our own property. And that within the property, our own watershed, uh, when we do get rains, we also have runoff that can um, come off of the surface of our roof or sheds, um, garages and so forth. And as it comes down onto the property, a lot of times it can run off down the driveway over a sidewalk into the storm drain with it bringing any type of uh, chemical, synthetic fertilizers, um, any synthetic or chemical pesticides um, with it. And so what we just like to do is bring some awareness between um, this water quality by offering products that will certainly take care of, well, products and techniques that will certainly take care of any pest problems that you have around your home and garden, but will not pose a threat to the waterways. And we're uh, integrated pest management educators. And so what integrated pest management is, or IPM, it's a decision-making process that allows us to look at the system as a whole. And we use science-based strategies and techniques to solve the problems. Uh, oftentimes what we see are symptoms of a problem. So it's not always easy to uh, really identify what's going on. So we have to dig a little deeper. We start to ask a number of questions, like what is really truly the problem at hand? And is it a problem that we can live with or do we need to take action? And then the uh, on the other side of that, it is uh, in, in employing different types of uh, tools that could prevent the pests from happening. Uh, we then uh, will want to identify the pest. If we can't identify what the problem is, then it's gonna be difficult to solve that problem. And the different types of action steps that we choose to utilize are going to be cultural controls, which is bolstering the health of the garden or the home, uh, cultural controls, which are the tools we use to prevent and manage pest problems, biological controls or using living organisms such as beneficial insects uh, and supporting the habitat and ecosystem of our gardens. And then uh, chemical controls, which are the pesticides. We always use these as a last resort. And we really wanna make sure that we are uh, very specific and selective about the pesticide that we use and that we're just targeting the pest and that we understand how the active ingredient works and those unintended consequences. But I'll get a little bit more into that in a bit. So another way of looking at IPM is with this illustration. So we're going to see some activity. We're going to identify and monitor. Is uh, we? It's a moth, for instance. Is this a problem, or is it just? Uh, is it a beneficial or insect, or is it a pest? And then we're going to evaluate to decide uh, if it's something we need to take action. We can certainly work with preventive means to protect uh, our food crops. Our um, our plants, our flowers, or even prevent uh, critters from coming in the home. And then we can take action if necessary. And then from there, we monitor and take notes and decide if the action did actually work. So let's look at managing weeds in the garden. So when the rains come, so do the weeds. And so I just wanted to touch a little bit on some uh, healthy practices for managing weeds in the garden. So first, what I'd like to ask is, uh, what is a weed? And weeds are typically plants that are growing in undesirable places. So in this case, the borage, the kale, and the chard are all plants that are uh, reseeding themselves throughout my garden, at least, with ease. And though chard and kale is a food crop, in some cases, I do have to pull it out because it is growing somewhere where I did not want it to grow. The UCIPM website has an amazing gallery uh, to help you identify the weeds. And this is going to be really important because when we can identify the weeds, then we can really identify the life cycle of that weed and then understand a little bit more, a little bit better how to manage the weeds. 
So we want to understand the types of weeds that might be growing on our properties. Are they annual weeds, which sprout just from seeds? They have a one-year life cycle. They will go to seed. Those seeds will get distributed by uh, animals walking by or by knocking the weeds. The little seed heads will pop or the wind can blow those seeds. And that's how they will regrow. There's also biannual weeds that will also sprout from seeds and they live for two years. And then after that two year cycle, they will uh, go to seed, the seeds will get distributed and they will re-sprout from seeds. And then we have perennial weeds. These are uh, plants that have a, a longer than two year life cycle. They can grow from seeds, but they can also grow from their own roots. And the roots can be tubers, corms, bulbs, stems, sometimes even a stem laying on the ground will ro a root in. And uh, these are going to be the most problematic, but it's nice to understand what types of weeds we have in our garden. We also have cool rainy season weeds. So weeds that are going to pop up pretty quickly after the first round of rains. And then we also have warm season and summer season uh, uh, weeds that really are only going to thrive during those warm dry months. So one way to manage the weeds is to make the environment less desirable. And that could include increasing the health of the soil by amending that soil with compost. Uh, we can outcompete the, the weeds by uh, planting an area with more desirable plants. Uh, we can irrigate properly. What we find is that uh, if we're over irrigating an area, if an area, an area is staying too wet, uh, weeds will favor that area. Also what we see is, um, especially with drip irrigation, if we are just really focusing the drip irrigation around the drip line or root zone of the desirable plants, we see less weeds growing because we're not watering areas of the garden uh, that don't need water. So weeds are not gonna thrive in those areas. By feeding our plants with organic fertilizers, we're feeding a more natural rate and that actually will suppress weeds and allow the desirable plants to thrive. It's a little, sounds a little odd, but that's the truth. And then we want to protect the soil with mulch. When we have a nice two to three inch layer of mulch, which would be an organic wood chip or an arbor mulch, of course, not in zone one and in uh, only the garden beds of zone two in fire prone areas, we are able to prevent weed seeds from germinating. And if they do, they're very easy to pull out of that mulch. We want to avoid disturbing the soil. And what that means is tilling, because if there are weed seeds in that soil and we have turned them up, weed seeds can lay dormant for many, many years. And when we turn that soil, we're actually bringing a lot of those weed seeds closer to the surface where they're going to thrive and they're going to germinate and they're going to grow. And then if we, are hiring professionals, uh, gardeners to come in and mow our properties. We want to have them only use our equipment because the seeds actually get transported from garden to garden. And a question I get asked all the time is what's the best way to remove weeds? And it's an answer that no one likes to hear, but with weeding tools. Uh, understand that there are so many tools on the market. Uh, you want to pull them or remove them at the very first sight. We want to, at all costs, uh, avoid letting them go to seed. When they go to seed, that means you've just uh, inoculated the area with a lot more weeds. Uh, there's hand tools. There's hand tools that... Uh, require that you're actually on your hands and knees, but there's also weeding tools where you can stand up and uh, uh, rake the weeds or scrape the weeds off the soil or hand pull them out. And then of course we've got mowers and line trimmers and so forth. And then uh, a really great uh, trick I like to utilize, especially around the paths and around my raised beds, is smothering the weeds, preventing them from growing. And that's, uh, we do that with sheet mulching. And it's literally just layering 
couple layers of cardboard, especially overlapped at the edges, and then putting a nice layer of mulch on top, no less than three inches. And you can have an inch of car compost beneath that cardboard. You can have an inch of compost on top of the cardboard, but whatever's on the top, make sure you have at least three inches to four inches of material on top of that cardboard. And that's gonna do the trick. You don't even have to mow or remove those weeds. It's very easy. All right, now let's look at strategies for disease prevention. So a few of you said that you were very interested in disease uh, management around the garden. A couple uh, common uh, diseases that I'm faced with or I hear about is black spot and rust. That one is uh, very common. Rust literally is three-dimensional. Sometimes we'll look at a leaf and that rust is so uh, uh, prominent that it almost, you question, is this an insect or not? And uh, it is going to, uh, you know, stand above uh, that leaf tissue. Um, and then of course, black spot. Black spot is exactly that. It is black spots on a leaf. These are very common on roses. However, it's not limited to just roses. Uh, from there, during the growing season, when we have diseases like this, we want to remove those leaves at first sign and uh, remove them and get them off site. It's ideal to put them in the green waste can instead of the compost. Oftentimes our home compost systems are not going to get hot enough to kill all of the spores. So it is uh, recommended that we get the material off site. Now, situations such as powdery mildew, Powdery mildew is going to um, be similar. However, powdery mildew is going to, uh, the way you would manage it during the summer months is because it thrives in summer dry. When things are really, really dry and warm, that's when we start to see powdery mildew. And powdery mildew, unlike black spot and rust, can get removed with a syringe of water. So we could get a spray bottle filled with water and just rinse off the spores of the leaves, top and bottom, and that actually is going to remove the powdery mildew. However, similar to black spot and rust, we do wanna get that plant material, any of the diseased leaves off site in, in the green can. When we have leaves that are going to overwinter in our garden that have diseases on it, and this is kind of across the board, very generalized, but we're going to, uh, those spores are going to overwinter. So that's why it's so nice to get the leaves off site. And it's not gonna be much different with peach leaf coral, really any of those other fungal problems that can affect uh, many of our fruit trees, such as the shot hole fungus. Um, and off the top of my head, I'm not, I can't think of another one, but there are many common diseases. Uh, now, if it's a situation like fire blight, then you're going to want to definitely follow what the UCIPM uh, management uh, recommendations are. And we're going to be cutting away that diseased material and again, getting it off site. But for peach leaf curl, peach leaf curl is very common in our area because it thrives in cool, wet spring weather. And here in California, where we are fairly coastal, uh, we are not in the valley. We are fairly, we are pretty much on the coast here. Um, uh, we get cool, moist spring season. And it is just very common for peach is and nectarines to get peach leaf curl. And uh, what's important is that we remove the leaves at first sign and we can take advantage of applying a dormant spray. So dormant sprays, we start to talk about them right now because our the leaves on our deciduous trees are about to drop. We can even see today with this wind, a lot of leaves kind of blowing in the wind. Uh, so when we have, this is not going to apply to evergreen uh, plants such as our citrus, but this is for plants that lose their leaves. And when we are referring to a dormant spray, it is going to be a more concentrated application. So when we have a product like a horticulture oil, 
which is going to overwint, uh, kill any overwintering insects by kind of suffocating and smothering them. Uh, we are going to mix it at a stronger mixing rate. So it's going to be um, less diluted. It's going to be uh, um, more um, strong and we can spray it on the plant that has no leaves. Uh, it's very effective and we don't have to worry about those leaves being phytotoxic because the leaves are not on the plant. And it's a very excellent way to utilize a pesticide uh, during the winter months when the trees are dormant because our beneficial insects are not going to be as active. Uh, pollinators are certainly not visiting these plants because there's no flowers. And it's a really great opportunity to you get a lot of bang for your buck when it comes to a pesticide. Now, uh, for the diseases like the black spot, the rust, the um, peach leaf curl, we're going to work with a copper fungicide. And there are a couple different uh, coppers you'll see on the market. And again, we are going to mix it at a denser, uh, stronger mixing rate. We're always going to follow the instructions on the label. We're going to follow the application rate according to what it, the recommendations are for the plant. And we are going to apply that copper fungicide uh, and to kill any of the diseases that we may be experienced through this past spring and summer season. When we are mixing a concentrate, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, the label is going to say, and I'm just going to use this as an example, just to make math really simple. If it says four tablespoons per gallon, just because it's saying to mix a gallon doesn't mean that's what you need to do. We might not need a gallon of pesticide. So if this is the first time that you're spraying a plant, a tree, a hedgerow with a pesticide, what you wanna do is get your tank sprayer and just start with water in that tank sprayer. So the tank in the middle of these three different types of sprayers, let's just, for um, you know, sake of this program, to make things simple, let's just pretend that's a one gallon tank sprayer. It's of course not um, you know, sized appropriately with the other two pitchers, but let's just say it's a one gallon. We fill that one gallon up with water. We go out there and we spray our apple trees when their leaves are off. And then when we're finished spraying those apple trees, we're gonna then note how much water did we use? Maybe we only used a half a gallon. So that's going to be my indicator that I only need to mix half a gallon of pesticide according to the label's instructions for spraying a dormant application onto my fruit trees. So if it says four tablespoons per gallon, in this case, I'm only going to put two tablespoons for that half a gallon. I will share that the picture that tank sprayer on the far left, it's a handheld quart size hand sprayer. I have worked in many orchards. I have worked for many uh, properties. Unless you are working on a commercial uh, organic uh, farm where you're really producing a lot of food, I can assure you that that small handheld is going to be all you need. Uh, you you trust me, we don't have a tendency to mix or to, to spray as much pesticide as we think we need. It's always a little less. And if you've got a little pesticide still in that bottle, we have to still spray until we've used it all up. Then we add some water to that container and we shake it up and then we spray again. We add water for a second time we shake it up and spray again. And then and we're spraying the plants and that's how we clean the bottles. So we're not pouring any pesticide down the drain or in the soil. We don't store the pesticides. Understand that the concentrated pesticides don't have any um, stabilizing agents or preservatives. So it's really intended to use what we've mixed. The hose and sprayer is going to be a little bit uh, more challenging to use, because the mixing rate might not be accurately um, dialed in. And when we're spraying a hose and pesticide, imagine the tree that has no leaves on it and we're spraying 
a lot of the pesticide is going to go past those twigs and on to something else. Hopefully it's not your car in the driveway or the house or other plants that have leaves on it because then it could actually burn them. So uh, just be aware that it's going to be a little bit more challenging to use a hose and sprayer. And um, yeah. All right. So if you've got any questions about weeds or um, diseases or spraying uh, a dormant application, go ahead and put it in the chat or keep it in mind and we'll get back to that in a moment. So now I'm going to just briefly talk about preventing pests from entering your home because this is going to apply to our next couple pests. So we, um, I, I talked to a lot of people in the aisle and a lot of times it's always going to, well, it's always going to be the pesticide aisle. So I'm talking to lots of folks in the pesticide aisle and they're asking me questions about rodents and ants and cockroaches and um, spiders and let's see, flying insects like mosquitoes or houseflies. And they would like to know what's the best management. Well, exclusion. So when we're trying to prevent uh, insects or pests from getting into an area, we want to see how we can prevent them from coming in and exclude them. And these are some tools that work really well around the house. So quarter inch hardware cloth. This is something that I'm going to be talking about when I get into rats and mice in a moment. Quarter inch hardware cloth is galvanized wire mesh or fencing. You can find it in the fencing department uh, at your local home improvement or hardware store. It is, uh, we talk about quarter inch for rodents because uh, mice and young rats can fit through a three eighths of an inch hole, which is the size of a pencil, but they can't fit through a quarter inch hole. So that's why we use quarter inch hardware cloth and that nor that can they chew through it. So hardware cloth behind vents and, um, you know, and you know, any holes that we might see where there could be points of entry, great way, very inexpensive to prevent rodents from coming in the house. A fresh bead of caulk around windows, floorboards. Um, this is also going to prevent crawling insects from coming in, such as ants, uh, cockroaches, spiders. Weather stripping, that seems really simple. We just put weather stripping around the door. Not only does it keep the heat and in and the cold weather out, but it also prevents crawling insects from making their way in. Uh, sheet metal corners such as this, this is brilliant. This is one of those uh, pieces that you would find where um, at the hardware store where they have the gutters and downspouts for your roof. This is just um, a corner that you can put in the corner of your garage door to prevent rodents from coming in. So of course, this is the outside of the garage door. This is going to get screwed onto the side of the house, but it's going to be plumb and plush against that garage door where the rodents have gnawed or dog-eared that little corner to get in. That is going to prevent them from coming into the garage door, any door in the, uh, around your house. It's going to be a perfect, very inexpensive fix uh, screens in the windows are going to prevent flying insects from coming in. And then a door sweep. A door sweep is one of the best tools that you can use to prevent those crawling insects from coming in your house. So with that, let's talk about managing ants. So when we have ants coming in the house and we're going to start to see them once the rains come, so do the ants. We might see a scout or two coming through. Well, you know what, just wipe them up. Just clean them up with a little, uh, you know, just a soapy rag of water or just with some water, just clean it up, you know, whatever, if you wanna use something like an eco cleaner, all purpose, uh, less toxic household cleaner, fine. But really just a rag with some soapy water is gonna do the trick because we're also cleaning up the scent trails. From there, if we happen to come home and there's a whole trail of ants coming in, then we want to uh, look a little bit closer and see what are they getting into. A lot of times they're coming in looking for food and water sources. So we really want to clean up the food crumbs. We want to uh, fix any leaks around the house, like maybe underneath the sink. 
to prevent them from uh, being attracted to coming in. But from there, uh, we can seal up any cracks and crevices with that fresh bead of caulk uh, around the windows and floorboards and such. New weather stripping on the doors and uh, screens in the windows are all going to work really well. But when we have that ant infestation, the best way to manage ants, the most effective way to manage ants is going to be with a bait station. The bait stations uh, that have active ingredients uh, such as the boric acid or the sodium tetraborate. Uh, I can't pronounce that word. I'm, I forgot. Anyway, or a hydromethylene or the avermectin B. These are all going to be actives that are going to be extremely effective where they will take the bait back to the colony, feed everybody, and everyone's going to die. Some of the other baits that are on the market are almost too strong where the ants don't make it back to the colony to feed everyone. They kind of die along the way. So that's why looking at um, ant bait stations that have these active ingredients are going to be ideal. Now, if we then after, you know, it could take about four days before that ant infestation goes away. And in the meantime, if we could see where those ants are coming in, where that point of entry is, then we know after the ants have gone, we can just seal that hole up and then wait until they find another way to come in. Now, if we're looking for a, uh, a, a, a pesticide that kills ants, a product like Orange Guard is going to be excellent. There's other products on the market that are eco-friendly, such as their Zevo products, Eco Logic, Eco Smart, Raid even make, making um, uh, Raid Essentials, where they all have very similar active ingredients. They're essentially uh, concentrated essential oils that will uh, kill on contact and then also offer some very temporary repelling properties. So they're gonna be safe and effective around the home, uh, will not be toxic to pets for children or for us. However, it is always nice to keep pets and children away from uh, any type of product. The ant bait stations will be out of reach from them because children and pets like to chew on little plastic things. And until that, uh, spray pesticides such as the orange guard is dry we want to make sure that our pets and children are staying away from it once it's dry it'll be fine all right if you have any questions about ants please put them in the chat so now let's talk about um ipm for rodents this is a very big topic i have a tendency uh, I'll share that I really get this question every day this is a topic i talk about more than i'd like so I like to start with a warning because some of us are sensitive to, um, you know, some of the details when we're dealing with uh, rodents and other um, small animals that we're going to be discussing pest management for rats and mice. And there will be discussion about eliminating these pests. Responsible elimination is to be done in the most humane way. So with that said, I would like to share that rats and mice are both rather different. However, I'm going to generalize for the sake of time. For more information on the differences between rats and mice and for specific management um, support, you can refer to the UC IPM website as well as the handout that I emailed to you before the program. For those of you that registered late, I'm happy to email these handouts out again. But uh, I will share a couple of things that rats can chew through more than you would realize. They can chew through steel wool, expanding foam, aluminum, concrete, drywall and plaster, rubber, plastic and wood. What they can't chew through is that galvanized quarter inch hardware cloth that I mentioned and sheet metal roof flashing. OK, so these are things that we really want to utilize as when we're trying to prevent them or exclude them from coming into an area. So for, I'm going to specifically be talking about inside the house. However, if we're talking about rats getting into a chicken coop, well, instead of using poultry wire, cause they can just walk right through that, we're going to make sure that that chicken coop is actually, um, we put some quarter inch hardware cloth over that poultry wire so that we can uh, prevent them from coming in with ease. 
So here we are, examples of how to use that quarter inch hardware cloth. When I was talking about that garage door, have those corners have little uh, points of entry for rodents. They will gnaw through that rubber very quickly, very easily. So we put these little um, you know, sheet metal or galvanized corners, take advantage of that. And also making sure we're putting that quarter inch hardware cloth behind uh, the dryer vent the foundation vents, the attic vents, chimney flues. And for those of us in fire prone areas, what I recently learned is that instead of using quarter inch hardware cloth, we use eighth inch hardware cloth or eighth inch galvanized mesh. And the reason why is because the eighth inch prevents embers from coming in. So now we're preventing embers and rodents. So isn't that neat? So there's a lot of words on this page, but what I really want to share is that it's really important to go through and uh, inspect your entire house. Now, some people will say, oh, my house was built like in the 1880s. I've got an old farmhouse. There's no way I can go through and plug up all the holes or, you know, yes, this might seem like a very daunting, overwhelming task. However, give yourself some time. It could take months before you get through every room, but once we've plugged all the holes, we have solved the problem. So we're going to replace that weather stripping on the doors and on the garages and make sure everything is really secure and plumb and that there are no points of entry. We are going to check those foundation and attic vents and we're going to you know, put those uh, hardware cloth, quarter inch or eighth inch behind the foundation vent. We can take those foundation vents off, cut the hardware cloth to fit, put the foundation vent back on because sometimes it's decorative and we prefer to see the decorative vent cover than the hardware cloth. We're going to also check the fireplace, the chimney vents, the stove vents, laundry dryer vents, make sure they're all securely covered with that hardware cloth and that rodents are not able to access uh, those areas. We are going to put that sheet metal uh, flashing or hardware cloth with expanding foam. Um, if we need to fill in the gap with the quarter inch hardware cloth, we can fill it in with expanding foam or similar, but maybe we have a small hole in the corner of the attic where the roof meets the side of the house, or maybe it's that hot water heater pipe that's going from inside the house to outside the house. So these are all tools where we want to look and see. And again, if there is a tiny hole that you can definitely fit a pencil through, understand that a mouse or a young rat can fit through that. We are going to uh, patch uh, any holes and um, under sinks and absolutely caulk any areas that need to um, be filled in and you know repair any holes that are in the wall with patch kits. We're going to place pet food in metal containers with tightly closed lids and we're going to uh, reduce the pet food access. So if we're feeding our pets outdoors, let's limit the amount of time we're feeding them. Uh, trust me, those pets are smart. They're going to learn to get the food when it's there. But then we want to bring that food back inside because if we leave it out all day long, it's not just our pets that are eating the food. It's also the rodents as well as other uh, critters. And you know, a lot of times the rodents like to nest in cardboard boxes. So if we notice there's a nest um, of rodents in our garage, let's start to store things in plastic bins. They won't choose through the plastic bins if there's no food inside the plastic bins. If there's food inside those bins, they'll definitely chew through it. So in that case, food is always going to be stored in those um, galvanized garbage cans. When we have a situation where we need to, uh, you know, employ uh, reducing the populations, we are going to work with kill traps. Uh, these are going to be the electric traps or snap traps. And the way we work with these traps is that we are going to bait the traps first. We are not going to set the traps. So in the case of the electric traps, we're just not putting batteries in them, okay? And the case with snap traps, we're just not setting that trap. We're just going to leave it um, just relaxed and we're going to bait the triggers or in the case of the electric traps, we're going to throw that bait down into that tunnel. Baits 
we're going to look at, um, it's not just peanut butter, but we can look at a little piece of salami or bacon or a piece of a meat stick, like a Slim Jim, a little piece of a chewy granola bar. It's Halloween season, so Halloween candy. Uh, a little piece of like a Fig Newton or similar dog kibble, kitty kibble. Um, if they're getting into the chicken feed, um, walnut or other type of nut meat. But essentially what we wanna do is make sure when we do trigger, the, uh, we put the bait in the trigger, it is tiny. It is just a tiny, tiny little bit. It is smaller than a pea. And if it's in the bucket, such as the uh, trap on the Tomcat Jaws style, we wanna make sure that it is really deep inside that bucket. We want that rodent's head to have to dig, like really reach in to pull that bait out, set the trigger. For the electric traps, we really want that rodent to go way into the back so that they can get, um, um, humanely um, shocked and electrocuted. So those are what we do. After we baited these traps and they're used to feeding off of it for uh, you know a few times, we're really gonna rebait these about four or five times. Then we set the traps. Once we uh, set those traps, we are going to have success where we want to monitor. We want to remove the rodent, uh, the dead rodent immediately. We want to dispose of it in a sealed bag and place it in the garbage. Ways to set traps are going to be in this illustration. Uh, the professionals say it's important to saturate the area with traps. Like sometimes the cases would be no less than 16 traps. However, uh, that's that seems really like a lot. I think it would be really hard uh, for me to, uh, for me as a consumer to go into a retailer and if the associate was saying, you gotta buy 16 traps, I would think that they were crazy. However, uh, you know, the Victor traps, those Victor wooden traps, Tomcat also makes wooden traps. These are going to be very inexpensive and I would say at least four traps. Really, just try to uh, get as many as possible. We want to screw those wooden traps down. Uh, we can screw them down onto a just a piece of fence board. Uh, those, or we can, you know, have that trap up against the side of a like on the four by four post coming off the back deck. The point is, is they don't have to be just on the ground, and it is important to secure them because the traps really are are. It's important that they utilize the velocity of that um, of that motion when that tr the trigger is is hit that trap is going to snap really fast and the velocity of that snap is actually what is going to humanely kill the rodent and if it's not secured down that trap is going to do one of these before it you know it kind of settles down. In that case, we might not be killing the rodent. The rodent can actually walk away with it. So those are some tips I can share. When we have rodents out in the garden, uh, this is a big deal, but boy, let me tell you, it is so important to remove those places of harborage, remove that ivy whenever possible. If you can't remove it, mow it down. You can get a line trimmer and really get it down so that there's no hiding places. We want to remove the resource, uh, all food sources. We want to contain the compost stations and the chicken coops, exclude the rodents. And we do that with that quarter inch hardware cloth. We want to keep the lids on garbage cans. We want reduce the uh, pet food availability. We're going to rethink bird feeders because that's just free food for the rodents. We're going to exclude them from our food gardens. We're going to trim away trees from the house. Keep in mind that rodents, the rats can jump three feet across. So if we've got rodents accessing our attic from a tree, make sure that tree is trimmed back pretty far from the roof line. Okay. When we talk about excluding rodents from the garden, people are like, that seems impossible. But guess what? I got all of these off of Instagram. These are all the different types of home gardeners that I follow. Some of them are professionals, but these are the tips and tricks that we use to prevent critters from getting into our food. And it's not that expensive. And it, boy, it sure prevents a lot of pests from accessing food crops. And uh, for those of us that are on, um, have larger properties or um, have a lot of outdoor activity, this is a very humane outdoor trap. It's not cheap, 
but it's very effective. This is the Good Nature A24. You can see it at just about any hardware store in the area. They are very popular right now. They have really, uh, really are um, get a lot of great feedback and reviews from associates and from the consumers. So check this out. And for the rodents that are getting into our cars, uh, let me share a couple of things. We always want to park our cars with the air vents closed. Apparently that is how they access uh, the inside of the cars. So we don't recommend placing any of those repellents in or on the engine. It's really, you're going to put those spray repellents um, for rodents around the perimeter of the car. Um, we want to park our cars away from those uh, you know, ivy, any of those places of harborage, any shrubbery areas or bird feeders. If they have chewed on the wire, uh, Honda makes this official rodent tape that's infused with the capsaicin. So that's kind of interesting. And before you get in the car, or periodically, if you're walking by the car, just bang on the car to scare them away, to prevent them from feeling really cozy. And so let's just finish up with tips for using pesticides. So identification is the key. If you can't identify the pest, such as uh, if it's a weed or if it is a critter or if it's an insect, it's gonna be really challenging to solve the problem. So pest identification is key. And then from there, we wanna understand the life cycle. So as I shared right now, we know that typically the ants start coming in looking for water. So that is something that is um, maybe not directly related to the life cycle, but I know it's part of the pest habit and the timing. And then from there, we wanna understand, are there any natural enemies? Are there any beneficial uh, predators around? We don't have ant eaters in this area. So in the case of ants, um, I'd have to say no, because what I know is that over 90% of the bugs, the insects that we see in the garden are actually beneficial. So we always kind of wanna understand what's going on. Take that step back and look at the big picture. And when we use pesticides, it's really always as a last resort. Something I like to share is the pesticides don't solve the problem. They just kill the pest. So we really are, the whole concept of integrated pest management is with the prevention and um, utilizing all those modes of action and then monitoring. And if we do need to use a pesticide, we're very specific about how we use that pesticide. We're always using less toxic and eco-friendly. We're going to apply it according to the labels instructions. We're always going to wear PPE because even eco-friendlies can cause uh, you know, uh, a dermal reaction. We don't know. And we want to understand the risks and the unintended consequences of our actions. Some products are very broad spectrum, such as neem. Neem is also going to kill a lot of beneficial insects if they're present. So in the case of eco-friendlies, a lot of times they could take longer to work. So as I mentioned, those ant bait stations could take about four days before we actually see that the ants have been eliminated. So we just want to be patient. We want to understand how that active ingredient is supposed to work so that we're not disappointed. Timing is important. We wanna know that pest life cycle and apply that pesticide at the best time. We're gonna spot treat in the case of spraying um, a pesticide outside, for instance, let's just say um, the uh, copper fungicide on our dormant uh, plants, I'm only going to spray the plants that I noticed the diseases on. I'm not gonna spray everything, okay? Or I'm just going to, for aphids in the spring, I'm only gonna spray the plants that I see the aphid infestation on. I'm not gonna spray all the other plants because each pest is very host specific. We're applying pesticides at dusk with the exception of the dormant sprays. And I will get into that in a moment. We apply pesticides at dusk. And the reason why is because our beneficial insects and pollinators are less likely to be active. And now that pesticide has the entire evening to dry. And then in the morning when it's dry, beneficial insects and uh, pollinators and pets and children can go and frolic and hang out. As long as that pesticide, when it's eco-friendly, is dry, it is not going to have residuals that will cause harm. When it comes to dormant sprays, we want to make sure we're spraying, well, this goes for all pesticides, I guess, 
anytime we spray a pesticide. We wanna spray when there isn't rain in the forecast for 48 hours, when we're not about to have a frost or excessive heat. Okay, so those are very important. And if we are um, growing a lot of biodiversity to attract beneficial insects, or if we're purchasing beneficial insects and releasing them, let's give them a little bit of time to do what they need to do before we apply a pesticide. And something I really want to just as a side note mention, we absolutely want to avoid products that contain neonicotinoids. Uh, these are also called neonics or uh, imidacolprid is a very common one. Um, these are products that are used as systemics and they get applied either as a soil drench around the root line or we are going to, um, spray them on the plant and they get absorbed into that plant tissue. What happens is, is that they are showing up as a, a problem for water quality. They're not breaking down, but when we apply them as a soil drench or as a spray, because they move through all the different cells, including the root system, they can spread through the soil, through the roots of the plant, and also migrate through the soil to other roots. So let's say you might be applying it to your rose, which is very common. However, if there's wild uh, wildflowers in the other side of uh, the bank of maybe your rose garden, they're going to absorb that pesticide. And then when pollinators and um, bees, butterflies visit that flower, they're going to um, take on the pesticide and they will also be killed. So that's just a side note. Um, something I like to share is what do we like to do when we no longer need to use our pesticides and we've got products that we no longer want? We're going to take them to our local household hazardous waste facility. It's free. It's easy. For Sonoma County, it's in Petaluma on Meacham Road. Check it out. I'm a huge fan of getting products off site, especially since we are in fire and flood areas. Let's just get products that we don't want off site uh, so they can be stored appropriately and understand that even Windex is considered household hazardous waste. So some online resources. These are also on that handout that I gave you, uh, but we've got the Our Water, Our World website that has a catalog of fact sheets that will help you with pest management. And then of course the UC statewide IPM program, which really goes into a lot of depth for pest management. But that's where you're going to see the weed gallery as well as a new feature, which is um, wildlife identification for pest management. We've got the bugguide.net. If you happen to have an insect in the garden that you don't know what it is, take a picture of it, email it to them at this website. They will give you a proper identification. And then if you're curious to learn more about the, how the active ingredient works on your pesticide, even the eco-friendlies, please visit the National Pesticide Information Center. If you need to hire a professional, there is information on uh, tips for hiring a professional at both the UC IPM website as well as Our Water, Our World. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us and I'm happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you so much, Suzanne. Got a lot of good questions here. Um, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, so um, let's start with some questions about ants. Um, folks are wondering, you know, do they cause damage? Can they, can ants be beneficial? They eat termite eggs. Um, and do they, are they food for spiders, et cetera? So can you speak a little bit more about the role of ants in the ecosystem? Love it. Yes, yes, yes. So ants are beneficial. Uh, they aerate the soil. They are going to um, eat other insects, you know, they're an indicator for termites, and they also pollinate some plants. Um, they are going to be food for spiders. They're also going to be food for other insects like, um, well, and also our lizards, uh, but crickets, things like that. So birds, um, they definitely are gonna be food. However, uh, the ants, um, typically we don't really want ants coming in our house because they're just going to uh, be looking for food and water. 
And oftentimes it's just, you know, more of a nuisance than it is necessarily public health. However, uh, with that said, out in the garden, um, typically ants are not going to be so much of a problem unless they're climbing up, trailing up, you know, like one of your fruit trees or trailing up, um, you know, uh, one of your ornamental shrubs, such as like an abutilon. When we see ants trailing up into a plant, it's typically an indicator of another problem because they're farming the secretions of these insects, secretions referred to as, or we call them honeydew, they're farming this honeydew. And so when I see ants going up like my plum tree or an abutilon or a mallow, I, it's telling me that I've got aphids or scale insects or something else going on that's creating these secretions. So they're actually doing me a favor because then I can uh, look to managing that other pest problem. Sometimes right. ants will, you know, take over a container or a raised bed. Typically, once we just start to cultivate and work those raised beds or those containers, start to irrigate those areas, the ants will move on. Um, and a quick follow up on that is if they use tarot traps, will lizards be harmed by eating those ants as they're on the way back to their Great question. Colony? Uh, no, what happens is, is the boric acid, the way it works, it disrupts the enzymes of the, uh, of that insect, such as the ant also works on cockroaches, um, and silverfish. However, boric acid is grams to weight. So, uh, the lizards are much larger than the ants. There's enough bait to kill the ant, um, and well, a number of ants, but it's not enough to kill a lizard. So hopefully that makes sense. Great. Um, can you speak a little bit about white flies? This person has a few plants that are infested with white flies. Yeah, white flies really can be a problem. For me, when I'm talking to folks about white flies, I will share that they do thrive in dry, hot conditions. So when we start to get into that heat of the summer, we have a tendency to see white flies, but usually it's because we're overwatering. And when we can really ensure that we are not overwatering, so watering our plants deeply and thoroughly, but letting that soil dry out enough, according to the plant's needs, then we'll see the decline in the white fly. So there is a relation there. So I just like to point that out. Uh, but from there, what I would do is remove those leaves that are heavily infested. Um, we can, it's the nymphs of the white flies that are uh, sucking all the juices of all those sugary secretions out of the leaves. Um, and then the adult white fly is flying around. So we can use yellow sticky traps to trap the adult. We can use an insecticidal soap uh, to uh, suffocate and kill those nymphs that are soft bodied. That will be good management strategies, but, uh, but really make sure your irrigation, that that plant is draining well enough. It's not staying too wet. Great. Okay, we're gonna take a break from insects for a second and talk about lemon trees. Um, Great. This person, lemon tree is just not taking off like they would hope to. Uh, that it would and wondering what can be done to support that lemon. So um, citrus are heavy feeders. So a couple things out the gate I would share that one that you're feeding the citrus regularly and ideally with organic fertilizers. So what that means is either using the organic Job citrus steaks those are very easy to use follow the directions depending on the size of the plant um, you tap them into the soil and they last for, I think, about three months-ish. Uh, if we're working with a dry granular fertilizer, like from down to earth or EB stone or Spoma or something similar, then we are going to follow um, the directions on the bag. But typically, we are going to be fertilizing every month to every other month during the growing season. The growing season is going to be uh, March through October. And we're going to apply a cup of fertilizer per inch of, di uh, of diameter. So if the diameter is two inches of that trunk, the trunk is two inches wide. 
uh, we're going to put two cups of fertilizer around the dripper line. We're just going to scratch it in. From there, I would make sure that the plant is uh, getting sufficient water, that it is getting nice deep watering and that it's able to dry out and that it's getting no less than six hours of direct sunlight. Um, and those are all the things that I would start with. I would then look if it's planted in the ground or gophers gnawing on the root systems. Um, those are all the places I would start. Great. Um, and someone wanted to just share a comment, which I think is a good comment that um, a lot of times it seems like there is an issue with pests, but actually the tree is just still really tightly tied to the strap uh, or really tightly tied to the stake that comes with it for shipping. And they're starting to get sort of strangled. So someone just wanted to comment yeah. on that. And if you uh, have point. anything to add. Yeah. And so a couple last questions here. Diane wants to know, um, she just found an underground yellow jacket nest in her yard and wants to know how to manage that. Well, this is really awesome. The Sonoma Marin Vector Control, you reach out to them, they're in Katati, they will come and remove that nest for free. All we have to do is just put some flags or somehow um, note where that nest is. So when they have an agent come, they can identify it with ease and then they will remove that nest at no cost to you. Great. Um, good resource there. And then yeah. Janet wants to know about aphid treatment, saying a uh, typical aphid treatment is to spray them off with water that wastes a lot of water. And obviously with the drought, that's not great. So what are some alternatives? She's got a small tree that's getting a lot of aphids. Um, well, I will share a good tip to save water and then still using water is using that spray bottle of water. When we have a little spray bottle of water, we're able to syringe uh, with a really strong stream or blast of water with a spray bottle. And that actually saves quite a bit of water. Um, and it doesn't have to be necessarily clean water. It could be water from washing your vegetables or produce from the sink, just to share. But um, aphids are going to come every spring. That's something that we know. They go from kind of zero to a thousand overnight. However, aphids, you can easily wipe them off with your hands. You can syringe them with water. A couple of things you want to make sure is that you're fertilizing with organic fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizers are going to stimulate a lot of new growth. They kind of act like steroids for plants. Insects such as aphids like that new growth. So something to keep in mind. Um, we also want to make sure we're watering um, according to the plant's needs. So watering deeply, watering around the root zone, letting that plant dry, um, depending on how established it is and the needs of that plant. Um, so those are some places I would start. And then um, if I do need to go for a pesticide, I would work with insecticidal soap, something that I'm purchasing. Um, you were not making soap from detergent that we have in the house because that actually could be more harmful to the plant. But um, yeah, I would just start from there. Great. Um, and then this last one isn't really a question, but I think that, um, and you've already covered rats really well, but this person's um, apple tree got, you know, the rats oh, got yeah. all the fruit. Is there anything that could be done if you have control of the rats in your house, but you've got rats in the garden and they are eating your fruit. It happens all the time. Um, what's the best thing to do there? Yeah. So if the fruit trees are um, smaller, so home orchard practice is that the trees are, um, you know, the modern way of thinking and modern home uh, orchard practice is that trees are small, they're short. We can actually hand pick all the fruit, okay? We're not um, into fruit production. We don't need these big lollipops that we need an orchard ladder to climb up to harvest fruit. So um, that's best case scenario. Because uh, then what we could do is just put an exclusion cage over it with that quarter inch hardware cloth. And then with a door that we can enter and harvest. However, it's typically not the case. Usually, such as the plant, the trees that I inherited on my property are very large. And so what we're going to do, if I know rats are getting in the area, I'm going to try to remove any of the places of harborage around them. I want to discourage them from even 
getting close to my apple tree. I want to make sure that my property is not desirable for the rodents. Then I'm going to take those uh, snap traps and it doesn't matter if it's the Jaws style by, by Tomcat um, or you know, the, you know, the wooden ones that are like from Victor and I'm going to strap them on branches throughout my tree. I'm going to saturate that area. And then I'm going to monitor. I'm going to find a bait that they're going for. So I might even put a tiny little piece of apple in that uh, on the trigger, maybe a little apple and peanut butter, but again, really tiny amounts. And then I'm going to um, handle it that way. And then I'm going to remove that death, those dead rodents when I see them, and I'm going to reset the traps. Great. And this person was just adding a good tip that you could put like a squirrel baffle around the trunk to keep the rats from climbing potentially. That could work. However, um, if the tree is big, they can jump from uh, like fence line to limb. A lot of times we're in such densely um, planted areas that they're not usually standalone. So uh, that is a great suggestion but just keep in mind that it's, um, there might be other things you'll have to employ. Yeah, they're great jumpers. Yeah, they are. Okay, any last questions to throw in here before we sign out? Going once, going twice. Okay. And if any questions come up, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to answer your questions. And there's also going to be a very short survey that will be uh, emailed out to you. If you don't mind, just please take the quick three minutes to fill out those questions. It really helps us with our funding. We greatly appreciate it. Helps us with our programming as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening. I really appreciate your time and attention. And we are here to help you with your pest problems. So don't hesitate to reach out. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Suzanne, for all of your wonderful knowledge. Thank you, Kellen. Have a great evening. Bye.